Hey guys, welcome, welcome, welcome. Man, oh man, we are into August. Can you believe it? August 5th. It's insane how time is flying. Well, hey, thank you guys so much for being faithful to join me every Wednesday. Uh, this has been a tremendous study for, I think, for all of us. I've gotten great response from a lot of you guys uh, talking about how these messages about following have really impacted you. Uh, so I'm super grateful for that, that God's using it in my life as well as in your life. So let's start off in prayer and then we'll jump right into this study. God, thank you for this morning or this this, uh, this evening, Lord, for the opportunity we have to just to spend with you. God, you're so good. You're so good to us, Lord. And I just praise you, Father, for the goodness uh, that I've witnessed and experienced in my life and in the lives of my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me uh, to be a pastor to some amazing people. And God, I do pray that you'll help us tonight, Lord, to be uh, fortified, to be strengthened, Lord, to be prepared for the days ahead. Uh, we know the world is a dark place, but God, uh, light, oh boy, can make a tremendous impact. And I pray that, Lord, you'll speak to us tonight. Help us, Lord, to continue to grow in our knowledge of you. And Lord, our uh, understanding of who we are and God, who it is you expect us to become. Help us to focus tonight. Lord, help our hearts and minds to be ready to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. So we're, uh, as we, as you guys know, we've been walking through what it means to be a follower. We've been talking about um, the aspect of what it is for you and I to be followers of Christ. Again and again and again, he compels us to follow him, to follow him, to follow him. We talked about in Mark uh, 8, 34, there's a, a verse there where we, we sort of jumped off in this point here, which is this, and it says, when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, okay? This is the point that we're working through now. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, right? So that's our our our, our challenge is to follow the Lord, not to follow our own way. And we, this was really our jumping off point at really looking at what it was to follow. Now, in order to follow, we have to change the direction that we're going. If I'm going this way and I choose to follow you, I'm going to shift my direction and I'm going to, I'm going to follow you. So we're to change not only the way that we're going, but the things that we do in this life. We are all, uh, unfortunately prone to do things our own way. We're driven by self. We're driven by our desires, by our lusts, by our flesh. Um, Isaiah 53, six says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. Boy, that's us gone astray. Meaning we're not doing God's way. We're going our own way. It says we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, uh, laid on him the iniquity of us all. So it's talking about the fact that as humanity, we are tend, we have a tendency to do things our way instead of doing things God's way. So as we looked at this, this kind of started us on the journey of what it means to deny ourselves. What does it mean? Uh, now, if, if I'm going to deny myself, how do I go about doing that? How do I recognize what it is I'm supposed to deny? There's some things I'm supposed to embrace in life. There's other things I'm supposed to deny in this life. And so what we're doing is we're kind of going through and using the Bible to show us and reveal to us those areas of our life that we need to deny. Now, these are the things that used to have a draw on us. These are the things prior to salvation Now this Obviously, I'm speaking to you as if you are a child of God, that you are a born again believer, that you do know for a fact that you've received Christ as your savior. If that's the fact, if that's the case, I'm going to be speaking to you in that manner. If you're not saved and if you don't know the Lord, well, you have an opportunity tonight that if you want to receive him, he is ready, willing and able to receive you right where you are and restore you. Uh, and I don't know who that's for, but there's somebody out there watching and maybe you're questioning your salvation. Maybe you're doubting where your stand is. Maybe you say, you know what? I don't have this drive within me to follow. Well, there's, a, there's an issue there because our desire inside of us, the spirit of God that lives within us is drawing us to make good choices. It's drawing us to, to follow God. It's, the, it's our resistance to follow God that we'll feel in our life, this compulsion we're going to get to in just a moment, which is our compulsion maybe to do the wrong thing. Now, if our natural inclination, our drive is always to do wrong and we te we have to constantly hold down evil in our life because that's our natural inclination in order to force ourselves to do good, well, there's an issue there. And if that's where you are, then you know what? You need to be questioning your salvation because if the spirit of God lives within you, the very creator of the universe lives within you and God is love and God is pure and God is good and that lives within you and that in the, you are the temple of God. If that spirit is within you and you have no desire to ever do the right thing, you always want to do the wrong thing, There's that's not possible. If you are a follower of Christ, if you are a believer, not even a follower, if you're a believer, there is a deep desire within you to do the wrong thing. So when you do the wrong, when you do or to do the right thing and when you do the wrong thing, you are compelled 
to change your behavior. So as we're looking at this, these things that used to draw us prior to salvation, we were children of disobedience. We were ruled by our flesh. We were controlled and our set, set on a course of the prince and the power of the air, a course of destruction. So you and I, once saved, God said, hey, you know what? Now I've brought this into your life. You now have a relationship with me. Here's your opportunity to be free from the things of the past. And unfortunately, as believers, incredibly, we are drawn to the past. And we talked about different areas. We categorized four of them so far of really um, areas that were, uh, these were our compulsions prior to salvation, the things that used to control us and used to draw us. First we looked at was our desire to be first. Our desire to be first. This is to obtain, to have, to be admired, right? This desire to be first. We looked at, secondly, our desire to receive glory. Our desire, desire to receive glory. Boy, we want to be celebrated. We want to be honored, okay? And this is something that we all have Within us, unfortunately, these things, these old ways are still there. The Bible talks about the old man and the new man. Now, as a born-again believer, I'm a new man, but that doesn't mean the old man is dead. I've got to kill the old man, and I'm going to do that through the process of denying the old man. First, and then number three, we looked at occasion, a desire for occasion. This is a matter of getting respect, about um, gaining reverence from individuals, about making a name for ourselves, maybe in a position or in a title something like that. Then we talked about our desire to make a fair show in the flesh. These are people that are consumed with the things of the world. Their concern is the world rather than than God. It's this preoccupation with their flesh that lures them into their emotions. It draws them away from God. And they find themselves uh, really, uh, through this study, we found ourselves really discussing one of the main areas of destruction. Boy, right now it is so incredibly relevant, which is the destructive danger of the tongue. Words. These are words that are spoken. These are words that are also typed out, written, tweeted, whatever it is. Um, but the power of words to, to have destructive impact. And before we uh, continue in our study, I want us to really look at a warning from God about falling prey to these previous influences, these motivators that used to draw us, that used to drive us. And we're going to be go in the book of Ephesians. And we're going to go, we'll get 20 verses to go through. We're going to go through it as quickly as I can. But I think it's very key that we really look at this, Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 20. Uh, verse number 1, it says this, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Notice what he starts with. Be a follower. Okay, be a follower. Now, in order to follow, he says, it says, now he qualifies, he says, as... So he says, now I'm going to give you an example. I want you to follow as dear children. Notice the word dear, as dear children. These are not the disobedient children. These are not the children of disobedience. These are dear children. This means they are obedient children. These are children that if we think about our dear child, right? If we think about our little one who is dear, boy, she's not disobedient. She's a good girl. Boy, you know what does she do? She listens. She reverences. She follows instructions right? She is a good child. She is a dear child. So he says, be followers of God as dear children. Okay. That means that we choose to do things God's way as opposed to our own way. Verse number two says, it says, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. Remember always as, as in like, man, most important words in the Bible, they show you what God says. Look, if I want you to do something and I use the word as or like, I'm getting ready to give you an example. Walk in love. How do I do that? As Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Now we've talked about the power. We've talked about prayer and the sweet smelling savor of prayer. But I want you to recognize this, this love that we're supposed to have, this sacrificial love, look what it is. It says it's a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. That's a sweet smell, right? Something that something that's that's wonderful. Boy, I tell you what, my wife is a fantastic cook. Praise the Lord. I, I, I wish she wasn't as good a cook as she is, but but praise God, she's a fantastic cook. And I'm, I love her food, man. And I'm telling you, there are some things that she does when she fixes them, and it is intoxicating. I'm telling you, she does a pot roast. And she'll put it in all the fixings and stuff like that. And I don't know if you guys know, but puts it inside the, the crock pot thing. And buddy, I tell you, she gets that thing cranked up and rolling and and I, I mean, I can walk into the garage or just be in the house and smell that smell and be completely consumed by it. I, I don't know if you ever smell you know, you, you walk into a room and somebody's just made fresh baked cookies and, oh, that savor, the way it 
impacts you. Oh, it just it, it just fills you up, man. It makes you feel, oh, it's so satisfying. It's exciting. Listen to what this is. God's saying that our love, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. That our love, our walk, the way that we walk with God, the way that we follow him, would be like that pot roast in my nose or the cookies in your nose or whatever smell it is that just gets you, man. God says, hey, that's a sweet smelling savor. That's how you should be following me. Listen to this. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness. Now, fornication is any sexual activity outside of marriage. All uncleanness or, or covetousness. Uncleanness, doing things that are, un, that, are un, that are ungodly. Covetousness, those are things that desire for things, for stuff, man. We desire more. Let it not be once named among you. He says, look, don't let that be you. No, 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 I want the sweet smelling savor. What I'm asking of you in your walk with me, your walk with Christ, as you follow him, you don't let these things be the title that's used to you. I want people to call the word Christian. They want to see Christ like in you. He says, name among you as becometh the saints. He says, look, as children of God, don't let these be the titles that are attached to you. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. He says, look, I don't want you to be caught up in the things of the world, the cares of this world. We get caught up in so many conversations that are not profitable for the kingdom of God. We get caught up in times, and, and if we think about, if we have a long dissertation, a conversation, as Brother Eric spoke about on Sunday, and the fact that, you know, we can go through all the points and, and, and counterpoints, and we can make up an argument to argue a case, but bottom line is that's not going to change someone's heart. God's saying, look, I want you to make sure that what you're doing is profitable. You're not caught up into things, first of all, that are sinful, but also things that just really aren't profitable for God. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. He says, look, you need to spend your time when you're following me, being thankful that God's given you the opportunities that he has. Be thankful. I was, I was we, My wife and I saw a show last night where there was a man that was in a wheelchair. I mean, completely bound to a wheelchair, could barely use his arms. And it was watching his family trying to find a new home that would fit his lifestyle. And all the all the challenges that came along with not having the ability to walk, not having mobility. And I said, you know, I told my wife, I said, well, we are so blessed. And it's something that, you know what, daily we take it for granted. We jump out of bed and we stand and we walk to the bathroom, brush our teeth. And we think, man, I'm using my body. But we don't even think about it. And yet it is a blessing from God. We need to be thankful. Thankful hearts, man. It's a part of our prayer. We need to open up our hearts in thanks. First of all, when we pray, for this ye know, listen to verse number five, for this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. What I'm telling you, now, when you see this and you go, well, goodness gracious, what if I'm involved in things that I shouldn't be? First of all, get out. But guess what? As a believer, can we be involved in sin? Absolutely. That's why we have to worry about denying things. But what it says here, it says, This ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's like saying, hey, look, you know, these people are not, they're not going to inherit eternal life. What this is saying is simply, if you are a child of God and you are in living a life that is sinful. You know for a fact you are outside of God's will. And if you're not experiencing chastening, now the chastening is the pressure that God puts on us to repent, right? That desire to get us back with him. He wants to restore our relationship. We talked about the dwelling. The whole aspect of the tabernacle two weeks ago was the fact that God wanted a dwelling place with us. He wants a clean dwelling place. God, guess what? You and I are the temple of God. God needs us to be clean. He wants to dwell with us. He wants to, to, to commune with us. Listen to this in Hebrews 12 verses 5 through 8 talking about that aspect, right? If I'm a child of God, now we see here that he's saying, look, that no whoremonger is going to, they're going to, none of them are going to experience the kingdom of Christ and of God saying that, you know, that, and that's not saying that, Hey, you, you get involved in sin, you lose your salvation. That's not what that's saying. That's saying that this person has never established their relationship with God. Listen to Hebrews 12 verses five through eight. He says, have you, and, and you have forgotten the exhortation, which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Okay, so it's the same way. As God gives you, as God rebukes you, corrects you, right? He says, hey, don't be bothered by that. Recognize, he says, 
My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, that pressure that you feel to do the right thing, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Look, when, when things come down and, you know, and life starts to change and you find yourself in to face some hard realities because of the lifestyle you're living, hey, don't have a problem with it. Listen to this, verse six. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Scourges, man, that's punishment. So not only is God drawing us to repentance, but guess what? We will also face punishment. We've talked about plenty of times in the past in Galatians 6, 7, and 8. And it talks about, you know, uh, you know, you shall sow what you reap. And he says, but, you know, she that soweth to the flesh shall, shall reap corruption. So there is a scourging that's going to come for the sons of God. If we're living outside of God's will, guess what? You and I are going to face the scourging of God. Verse 7 says, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. Listen, he says he's reason why he's compelling you to do right. The reason why he's riding your back, the reason why you feel this pressure and this and this 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 guilt and this and this this weight on your soul. The Bible calls it. Um, 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 uh, 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 I'll think of it. I'll come back to it. Um, but you feel that 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 desire to do the right thing. It says here in verse the back part of this verse in verse seven says, "For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? If God really loves you and you are His son, He's going to correct you." Verse number eight. Listen to this. But if ye be without chastisement, meaning that I live in sin, but I am not bothered by it, okay? It isn't affecting me. Whereof all are partakers. He says, look, hey, what? This is what everybody, everybody has the opportunity to be involved in sin. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. He says, then you are not a child of God. So if you're telling yourself that you're saved and you're out there living in sin, and you have no problem with it whatsoever, and you're not chastened of God, God tells you, hey, guess what? Rude awakening. You're not my son. You're a bastard. You are a child of the devil, not my son. So if you're living in that sin and you have peace with it, there is according to God, you are lost. But if you are in sin, praise God, we can get out of sin. God's drawing us out. Let's verse number six in Hebrews, or actually in uh, Ephesians 2, or Ephesians 5, sorry. Ephesians 5, verse 6, it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience, right? This is where we were. We're dear children. We're not the children of disobedience. But it says, look, don't fall into the traps of the devil. He wants to draw you into sin. It says, verse 7, Be, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't fall into sin. If you're around people that are going to draw you into sin, guess what? You need to separate yourself. If you find yourself in conversations or things like that that may draw you that way, or you find yourself reading things or, or looking at things that are sinful, get away from those things. Verse 8, for ye were sometimes darkness. You used to be this person. This is the old man. But now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He says, hey, remember who you are. Remember, you are my child. And as my child, I want you to walk as children of light. Follow Christ. Follow Christ. Verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Oh, man. The, the fruit of our life as believers, that should be it, man. Fruit of the Spirit, all goodness and righteousness and truth. Verse 10. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, man. Revealing God's goodness to the world. Listen to this, man. This is what we're supposed to be if we're following. Verse, verse 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Don't even have friendship with it. Don't have a relationship with it, certainly, but don't even have friendship with it. Don't play with it. The Bible warns us, it says, don't give place to the devil. It's saying, look, don't you give him a, a doorway into your life. Don't give him an entry point. If the, if the entry point isn't through this, through this device and this device is showing you something you don't need to see, man, block it, stop it, stop, get away from it. Do not play with it. We talked about the, the fire of the tongue, man. Don't play with fire because guess what? You will get burned. You play with sin. It's just a matter of time before you will get burned. You will get burned. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works. Verse 11, works of, of darkness, but rather reprove them. Call them out. Reprove them. Verse 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Look, this doesn't even need to be a part of your conversation. Remember the danger of words. Verse 13, but all things that are approved are made manifest by the light. Boy, tell you what, man, when you bring that sin out into the light, guess what? It changes things. When we address our sin and we're honest with God and we bring it to the surface, boom, it's as long as you hide it, try to make it secret, it's a problem. 
You're not going to hide it because guess what? God already knows it. But you know what? Your sin will find you out. Deuteronomy, I think it's Deuteronomy 24 teaches us that. So we look at this. Whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Light, man. Light destroys darkness. So if you get darkness in your life and you're a believer, man, let the light pour into your life. Let God change things for you. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest and rise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, right? Circumspectly, man, you're walking diligently, man. You're, you're focused, not as fools. Because remember, if you're a fool, that's the wisdom of the world. That's 1 Corinthians 3.18 teaches us, you know what? That's that you got to become a fool in order to be wise in God. It says, but as wise, but as wise, we've got to follow God's way and not our way. Verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Dude, don't waste time because guess what? Time is short. It's running out. And as we're trying to live this life for Christ, let's not get drawn into those things that are destructive. Verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. Look, don't fill your stuff with the things of these world, the, 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 with this world, these things that we're trying to satisfy our flesh with. Fulfill yourself with the spirit of God and you will be so much better off. You'll find joy, you'll find peace, and you'll see that God can use your life. Verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Fill yourself with the things of God. Verse 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, giving thanks always for all things. That means the good things and the bad things. There are things that will happen in your life that are destructive and dangerous and hurtful. But if you allow God to work through them, you can be thankful for them. God uses all things, all things together for good for those that love God, that called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. Understanding where we've come from, right? And what God expects of us. Ephesians 5, 15, it says, 5, 15, it says, see then that you walk circumspectly, man, circumspectly, be diligent. That Ephesians 5, 15, be diligent, not as fools, but as wise. So as we wrapped up last week, last week, we were talking about the destructive power of words. We talked about it via uh, spoken language as well as text language. And we talked about the fact that God holds us accountable. There's an accountability with God in Matthew 12, 36 is this. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And as we discussed this far reaching impact of words, not only in a single person's life, but generationally as well, and we talked about the way that that, that sin and and, and 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 destructive language and hurtful things can be transferred to other people, even to children, which can pass on generationally. And some of us come from homes that that was the truth. There was a generational pain that was carried on, and we saw that hurting people. Guess what? They hurt people. That's just a tendency of humanity. Matthew fifteen eighteen says, "But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man." What you say reveals our hearts. What we say reveals our hearts. So as we closed last week, we celebrated the fact that that generational pain, that generational destruction that can come from, from hurtful words and destructive things, we talked about the fact that those things can be broken. The cycle of destruction can be broken, and we praise God for that. But tonight, we're going to look at what where the enemy won't stop with just words. He wants to use other things additionally. And I know I'm eating up time, but I'm telling you what, this stuff's just so good. It, it, it takes a little extra time. It takes a little extra time. Uh, he's always looking for avenues or willing participants to bring humanity away from God. He is always seeking to bring destruction. The enemy is in our life, always trying to divert us from God. His destructive force, he will use any means and any person to accomplish his end. So if we specifically, what I want to look at tonight is the information superhighway. If you never heard it used that way, that's the World Wide Web, the Internet. Now we think about a World Wide Web. Boy, this is certainly a web and it is spun by a spider that is seeking to destroy not only you, but your family. The internet is different. It's driven. It's driven by the flesh, no doubt about it. Because understand, when you feed the flesh, it pays. It pays. The internet is a source of trillions and trillions of dollars of revenue that are drawn away. From I mean, people are pouring hard-earned money down the drain. Because you know why? The me monster that we talked about in the last few weeks, the me monster, that one that's in me, the old man, the me monster that wants to feed his flesh, to feed his desires, to feed his lusts, that old man, that me monster, guess what? Boy, I tell you what, he is completely, he, he's never satisfied. And he's completely consumed with what these devices, what this internet access can do. 
Boy, I tell you what, it can open up anything and everything, good or bad, to the heart of man. And that's a dangerous thing because unfortunately, if we're not accountable to God, we think we can hide what we'll find ourselves is going back to those things we used to be drawn to. Those very same lusts, that, that desire to be to be first, that desire to, to receive glory, desire of occasion, and, the, and this one right now we're talking about, which is dealing with the flesh. So our focus has been on words, but I don't want to recognize some other areas where the internet is also very, very destructive. You know, something like this, the influence of shopping. Shopping. Now, I know that sounds like a silly one, but guess what? What does shopping do? It feeds into people's lusts. It feeds, you know, they, they want more. They become covetous. They look at something, you know what? And what they'll do is they'll spend and purchase things that they cannot afford to purchase. And they'll put themselves into debt. Or they'll if fulfill these immediate gratifications, which just feeds into this aspect of the fact that, guess what? We no longer have patience. We want something, we buy it, and it arrives at our house just like that. So it's this dangerous thing of feeding into our flesh through shopping. Then godless entertainment. Oh, boy. Godless entertainment. This is a celebration of and the desensitizing of sin in the life of believers. We open ourselves up to foul language that is used uh, uh, unbelievably so. And we hear these words and over a period of time, guess what it can do? It can desensitize us to the sin of it. Well, I'm not going to say it, but I can listen to it. There's sexual promiscuity. You know, the, the, the aspect of, of, of sexual relationships. And we look at, that's how things are supposed to be done. When you watch these things that are available to us by way, via, uh, of these godless sources of entertainment, then just mindless distractions. You know, I'm talking wasting time, games, trivia, whatever it is, you know, wasting your time on social media stuff, little Facebook posts, you can get caught into, man, I, it happens to me. Start reading something, you're like, well, that's interesting. And you read it, and you look, and you're like, man, I've been 15 minutes, I've been looking at this stupid stuff. Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever it is, people get caught up in this garbage, and guess what? At the end of the time, they're like, man, you know what? I just wasted that time. And we're all, fall, can fall prey to it. And in another area, sensual desires. Sensual desires, and this is a big one. And we're going to get into this uh, more as we move into another area, uh, and we get further down, and we get to, to number six, uh, or to number five. But we're looking at here is this fact of this inappropriate relationships, intimacy outside of marriage. Not only in what we're just what's displayed to us through a show, but the availability of things like chat rooms and 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 inappropriate relationships between the opposite sex that can develop and take place. And, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna camp out here just for a minute. And if you are a married person, I'm going to give you a very very stern warning. If you are married. The internet, a chat room, Facebook is not the place for you to have conversations with people, intimate conversations about your relationship with anyone other than your spouse and certainly not someone of the opposite sex. Because what will happen is we'll start off and it'll be innocent enough, innocent enough. I, I, you know, I just need somebody to talk to. I just wanted a, a, a lady's perspective on this. I just want to kind of see where she's coming from. And you know, she was so helpful. But she was so willing to listen. She was really, she was rooting for us to really succeed. And, you know, she was, she was there to back me up as, as our marriage. We were really going through some tough times. I mean, you know, I really needed somebody I could open up to and I could be honest with and somebody that, that I could tell what I was going through and what my emotions, what I was dealing with. And you know what can happen? What starts off innocent enough? Guys, I've been doing this long enough to recognize the fact that what starts out innocent does not end up innocent. I have dealt with enough broken marriages and, 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 and infidelity in relationships. Guys, it is a reality of our life and the world that we live in today. Sexuality is everywhere. And I don't care how strong you think your marriage is or how, how much strong your vow is to God. If you're not truly following him and you've got that crap and you're having these conversations, you're opening a door to destruction. And you know what it'll do? It'll bring, not only will it affect you, not only will it affect your spouse, it'll affect your family. It can destroy everything that God's given you. And it's an ungrateful attitude. And you know what? God has given you a spouse and that person is your other half. They're the one that needs to hear. Because remember the devil, how does he appear? He appears as one of two things. Either as a roaring lion, which you go, whoa, that's evil. I I'm staying away from that. You know, I, oh, you know, that's a demonic show. I'm not watching that. But then it can also appear as an angel of light, something attractive. And the seducing spirit can whisper in your ear. And if you are not careful, before you know, this innocent little relationship, this friendship turns into something else and you are faced with a 
horrible decision that you've made. And it just takes a split second to make the wrong choice. Don't do it. Stop now. If you're going to have intimate relationship conversations, you either need to go to a trusted uh, leadership person in your church. First of all, and that's your last resort. You need to go speak, speak to your spouse. Talk to a parent if you need some help. Do not go to someone who is a peer who is of the opposite sex. That is the worst thing you could possibly do. First Timothy 4, 1 Timothy 4.1 says this, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, clearly, God says, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Guys, when you fall prey to this stuff, your husband and your wife, they're the ones that need to get your intimate communication. It's so vitally important that, that the person that hears our heart is the person that we're married to. The Bible tells us in John 10, 10, it says, the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and destroy. That's why he's here. Jesus goes on further and says this, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. So you can use hurtful words, certainly to, to affect your spouse. But let me tell you what, the seducing words of, a, of another person, buddy, I'm telling you what, that can bring destruction like something you cannot even possibly imagine. You want to talk about a fire that gets out of control? Next thing you know, it goes from a friendship and emotions start to get involved because we're feeding into our flesh. The seducing words, the devil doesn't care. If he can destroy your marriage through you treating each other like crap, or he can use another person to seduce you into bed, he doesn't care. In the end, his desire is destruction. Do not give him place in your life. Do not. He would love, love nothing more than to steal your unity, to kill your love, and destroy your marriage and your home. That is his desire. You and I, guys, we are created for, 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 for a marriage that is the abundant life of God. That's what he intends for us, that abundant life. That's what God intends for our marriage to be. And it comes through clear communication, through love, through kindness, through honesty. It is absolutely imperative that we communicate with our spouse. It is absolutely imperative that we have clear, honest, truthful communication. Because guess what? The one person that you've been married to, the one you made that vow to them, guess what? That was a commitment that there would be no other. Those two became one flesh. And you are to, you don't have secrets from yourself, so guess what? You don't have secrets from them. You live this life together and you face the challenges together. And then when the devil comes, guess what? He has no power because guess what? You are unified. You are one. You stand and watch each other's back. I've got a couple that I work with right now. And I tell them, I said, look, you're Batman and Robin. Batman's, his job is to lead. Robin's always there to back it up. But guess what? They always face the enemy together. Batman's not fighting against Robin. That's not the case. It's always a united front. And as a, as a couple going against this world, man, to follow Christ, to love as God loves, to do as God's way, you need to be unified. That means you need to communicate with one another. If you're not talking, start talking. Have those tough conversations. If it's something you're struggling with, share it with your spouse. Help them. I know that's a lot to cover, but that I just felt like the Lord was leading me down that direction. That's something that needs to be said. I don't know who it was for. If it was for you, praise the Lord. Apply it because it's an absolute tr truth. But understand, this, this lust-filled fantasy land of the internet, it swallows up people by the millions every single day. It is destructive. And words are, man, I'm telling you, that words, that communication is dangerous. Be very, very careful. Very, very careful. So as they follow their lustful desires, Galatians 5, 17 says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are the contrary, the one to the other, right? So that you cannot do those things which you would. So we know that the, the serving our flesh is going to be destructive. We know that if we fall into these things, we fall prey to our flesh. It's going to lead us away from God. You know, there's this phrase, I don't know who wrote it. It says, sin will take you farther than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. And whoever wrote that probably wrote it from experience. And I'm telling you what, it's absolutely the fact. So if you're messing with sin, get away. Get away. Repent of it. Get back to following the Lord. Anyone who's ever embraced the world of sin, boy, I tell you, you can attest to the fact that it destroys you from the inside out. It does. And you have an opportunity as a believer to surrender yourself to the will of God, to follow the Lord and stay out of that mess. 
And don't live with regrets and brokenness. Don't live with, with just the, this sense of the fact that you've you've hurt God, right? That you've grieved the Spirit of God. No. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 1 Peter 5, 8 says this, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh to and fro, seeking you may devour. Man, he is tricky, he is slick, he is smart. And not understand, he has watched you. He knows your weakness. He knows if there's differences in your marriage and you're not communicating with your spouse and he thinks he can bring somebody in there that will listen. Boy, oh boy, guys. If Understand, husbands, you're not listening to your wife. It's just a matter of time before the devil will find some man that will listen to your wife. Speak, talk, share, open up your hearts. Open up your hearts. Galatians 2.24 says this, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Right? And we talked about that. This honest, clear communication, man. Don't keep secrets from one another. Face this world together. My, my wife and I have always said it's you and me against the world. And that is absolutely the key. Against the world. And we know the world is a representation of sin. Now, God wants us to have that abundant life, and that's the key. When we have that clear communication, when we have that loving communication, what's amazing about that is the fact those, the power of those words, the power of those words of honesty and truth and reality as we deal with the issues. Guys, don't be afraid to tell what's going on in your heart. Remember, your spouse is there. You guys are in this together. If you'll do it God's way and you'll be clear with communication and you'll do things God's way, he will restore you. And what's amazing is through that, that, that communication and that love and that unity, then you experience the abundant life that God has for us. So the devil says, look, do it my way. Steal, kill, destroy, man. It'll all be done. Marriages break up every day, every single day by the millions around the world, I'm sure. But certainly by the thousands, marriages come to an end and the devil celebrates. But God says, you know what, what the Bible says, you know what God hath put together, let no man put asunder. That man's man or woman. Work on your relationship. Share with one another. Understand the power of words, the power of words to destroy, but at the exact same time, powers, the power of words to heal. Oh my goodness gracious. Consider the healing power of words. Think about the fact, what saved your soul? It was the gospel, right? The gospel. God left his word for us. He left the word of God, the words of God. So the power of words to destroy, but guess what? The power of words to heal. They are the greatest power in the world for healing. Just like they're the greatest power in the world for destruction, they're the greatest power in the world for healing. And I've got some verses I'm going to run through them, and I know I'm going to take a little extra time, but you know, we're finishing the tongue tonight. We're doing it. Here we go. Hebrews 4.12 says this, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God looks within us, man, through the word of God. It's powerful. Romans 10.17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The word. Words again. The power of healing words. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Scripture means the word. The word is for all those things, man. Reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Acts 20.32 And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. The power of the word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, listen to that, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is that as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Praise God. Jeremiah 15.16, The words were found, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. First Peter 1, 1 23 says this, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The power of words to heal man. Psalm 107, 20, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Praise God. So, uh, John 15, 3 says this, now ye are clean through the word, which I have spoken unto you. So if we've used our words for destructive purposes in the past, man, it's time to turn that around. It's time to use them for the purpose of edifying, to build. Remember back in Ephesians 429, 429, we read this, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, to build up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. 
You and I should speak and it should minister grace unto the hearers. If you are caught up in things you should not be, if you're saying things you shouldn't be, if you've got anger in your heart, deal with these things. Bring them to God. Repent of them. Walk with him. Let your walk with God be one that is loving. See, by allowing the Lord to guide and direct our speech, what is amazing is you and I, where we used to be instruments of destruction, we now can become instruments of healing. The power of words. The power of words. God's given us his word. He's given us the ability to speak. And boy, we need to speak, not to get our point across, not to convince somebody, not to beat somebody down, but to let them know that there's a God that loves them. And when you share the testimony, the words of what God's done in your life, you speak to their heart, you give them hope when they are hopeless. Guys, the purpose of this life is not about being happy. It's about being holy. And if we are holy, that means we are following Christ. And if we'll do things his way, he will do things. And not only will he do healing temporarily here on earth in the lives of people, but praise God Almighty, permanent healing. Hello, permanent healing. Share the gospel with somebody. Let, somebody. let somebody's life be healed permanently. They may not have a good life on this earth, but there is coming a day when they will be with God. Praise the Lord. Guys, you and I have been gifted with the ability to speak, the gift of the ability to type, to send words. Let's be careful that the words that we use are ones of edification, to build and to heal and not to destroy. Because when they are destructive, we're a tool of the enemy. Oh, but man, when they heal, we're a tool of the Lord. Guys, that's why we're here. Thank you for spending this time. We did finish the tongue. Praise God Almighty. We got done with the tongue. Hey, next week we're going to move on. We've got, a, got some tough subjects to, to cover, but it's going to be so key for us as we learn to be true followers of the Lord. Let's go out this week and let's walk in the light that we not fulfill or be in the darkness. Let's walk in the spirit that we not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's follow God. Let's do it his way. And when those opportunities come and you feel the flesh rear up, go, you know what? Mm -mm -mm. My job is to die myself and follow him. Guys, thank you for being with me. I'll see you next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for tonight and this opportunity we've had just to, uh, just to hear from you. God, thank you for the amazing truths that are in the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to address and deal with uh, areas of sin uh, Lord, that constantly try to work their way into our life. As believers, we are uh, as, as vulnerable as anyone else to sin if we have our heads and our minds in the wrong place. Help us to be mindful of the influences we have around us. Help us to be mindful uh, of those things that we allow to impact us. And if I have a brother or sister out there that is struggling with a sin right now, they may be in a relationship that's inappropriate. They may be looking at things or reading things or saying things that they should not do. Lord, I pray that you will help them, God. Help them to turn, to deny it, to repent of it. And Lord, to, to simply surrender to be your child. God, help us to walk in the light. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be children, Lord, of the Most High. God, use our lives this week for your glory. Thank you for all that you've done tonight. Thank you for the opportunity we've had to be together. I pray that you'll guide us and use us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. I love you. I'll see you next week.